In the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Grateful that you are here. Looking forward to continuing our worship and our work of the church later on today. On an occasion like this, it's a joy to worship with the lay leaders and clergy of the diocese as we uh, do the ministry. And this ministry in the diocese doesn't happen without you. I've been reading the passages for this morning with specifically you and what the Lord has called you to in our diocese in mind. And I want to address you as diocesan leaders with a word of comfort and a word of encouragement because you know firsthand the difficulties and the barriers involved in ministry, along with the joys and the fulfillment. You know that you're dealing with real need and real suffering. You're serving and hosting people in the best moments of their lives. You have births, baptisms, weddings, graduations, and fill in the blank. But you're also serving and loving people at some of the worst moments in their life. Tragedy, abuse, despair, loneliness, and death. God calls Jeremiah, we also heard the Luke reading, but God calls Jeremiah to be his prophet in a very difficult setting. Nobody even wants to listen to what he has to say. And he knows that no one's listening. That's why he's called the weeping prophet. He's going around crying everywhere because nobody's listening, and he's crying over not the response, but over Israel's rebellion, and he's also just crying about worldwide sin. And that's why we have an entire book called Lamentations. It's connected to him. And then we have John Chrysostom, who we celebrate this morning. And his, his actual name was John of Antioch, but uh, and he's another example of difficulty in ministry. His name, Chrysostom, means golden mouth, and that's because he was so eloquent. And he's one of the four great doctors of the Eastern Church Fathers with Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Athanasius. But his sermons against corruption, it's bad to have sermons against corruption when you're eloquent because... Uh, <laughs> It earned him enemies in very powerful and high places, and so he was sent into exile where he died. And before I get into Jeremiah, you're familiar with those demotivational posters that have been around for a while? Okay, good. I'll explain them for those who don't understand. It has a typical motivational image on the poster, and then it has a funny counterintuitive, counter-motivational saying underneath it. Let me give you an example of one. This one stings a little bit, but we can laugh at ourselves, right? It's called tradition. <laughs> Just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's not incredibly stupid. <laughs> yeah. My personal favorite is You Are Special. It has a picture of a cute little puppy with his head tilted, big eyes staring at the camera, and it says, if you require additional affirmation, get a puppy. The rest of us are trying to work. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's discouragement. Discouragement, because there's nothing standing between you and your goal except a total lack of talent and a complete failure of will. <laughs> now, uh, that would be more funny if that wasn't a voice that we actually have on our heads. It's because of that that I want to bring you a word of encouragement. Because if you're like me, that's actually a whisper and a haunt that you hear when it comes to your relationship with God and with ministry. There's nothing standing between you in your goal except a total lack of talent and a complete failure of will. But God, through Jeremiah, says otherwise. First, you are loved before you could even try to earn it. In verse 5, Jeremiah is, says, God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. Before Jeremiah was conceived, God knew him. 
This foreknowledge of Jeremiah is more than foreseeing the future. It establishes a relationship between God and his prophet. And this foreshadows God's foreknowledge of his people, which is taught throughout all of the New Testament. You are foreknown by God. It doesn't mean that God looked through the corridors of time and saw your faithfulness and rewarded you. It means the opposite of that, that God set his affection and grace and love on you before you could earn or deserve his love. And so that foreknowledge speaks to your security in God's love. I think this nighttime liturgy I do with my daughters might capture that security in God's love. My daughters are 13 and 15. One of them's here now. They're going to trade out, and the other one's going to come later on today. And uh, I started doing this liturgy years ago, and I kind of wonder how many more years I have left doing it. As they grow old, I hope this doesn't grow old with them. Because I love reminding them that my love for them is secure in who they are, my daughters, not anything they do or don't do, accomplish or don't accomplish. And so the, the nighttime liturgy goes like this. It starts with a question, can you see my eyes? That's, and they say yes, if they can. Uh, it's all about being present with them. Can you see that I can see your eyes? I want them to know that they're seen and that they're known. Do you know that I love you? Yes. Why do I love you? Because I'm your daughter and you're my dad. Do you know I love you no matter what good things you do? Yes. Do you know I love you no matter what bad things you do? Yes. Who else loves you like that? God. Rest in that love. That's the last thing they hear. Remind them of God's love. Remind them of mine, but more importantly, remind them of God's love. Rest in that love. May we all know what G.K. Chesterton referred to as the furious love of God. God is not moody or capricious. He knows no season of change. God has a single relentless stance toward you. In Christ, he loves you because you are his, adopted into his family. Before he formed you in the womb, he knew you. Before you were born, he consecrated you. And this is all because of Christ. This is the love of God before you could even merit that love or disqualify yourself from that love because it's on the sake and merit of Christ alone. So first, you're loved before you could try to earn it. Second, you are accepted because he chose to be rejected. This whole foreknowledge thing is about God setting his affection upon Jeremiah and you and me in advance. In the Bible, foreknew also is in contrast with rejected. When it says foreknown, 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 the background of that is rejection, rejection, rejection. So it's, it's actually the backdrop of saying you're not rejected. So be assured that you in Christ are accepted. You're accepted because Jesus Christ took your rejection and gave you his acceptance. He took all of that rejection that you deserved and gave you the acceptance that he earned. And that's what grace is. That's the great exchange. It's grace given to you despite yourself and for the sake of Christ. And Paul Tillich in Shaking the Foundations said it better than I can, so I'm going to use his words. Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of meaninglessness and empty life. It strikes us when our disgust for our own indifference, our weakness, our hostility, and our lack of direction and composure have become intolerable for us. It strikes us when year after year, the longed-for perfection of life does not appear when the old compulsions reign within us as they have for decades. When despair destroys all joy and courage, sometimes in that moment, a wave of light breaks into the darkness, and it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted, you are accepted, do not try to do anything now. Perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek anything. Do not perform anything. 
do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. Leaders of the Diocese of Central Florida, rest in that love. First, your love before you could try to earn it. Second, you're accepted because he chose to be rejected. Third, your weakness is actually your strength. Jeremiah is intimidated, and he responds with insecurity, re responding, uh, referring to God's call for him to be a prophet, to speak God's words. In verse 6, he says, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth. I love seeing Jeremiah's timid response, which is echoed, if we're honest, in our own hearts. And that timid response to God is countered by the assurance of God's promise and purpose. Many times in Scripture, as a matter of fact, most of the times in Scripture, God is choosing the weak, the aged Abraham, the barren Sarah, the inarticulate Moses, the social outcast Canaanite Rahab, the morally blemished Jacob and David, the obscure Gideon all culminating in the suffering servant Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, after Jesus, calls himself the chief of sinners, and he also had to learn that God's power, as he said, is made perfect in our weakness. The assurance that God gives Jeremiah strikes a theme with the gospel, that God has chosen the weak to confound the strong, because the gospel is the power of God for salvation. In Jeremiah's weakness... Not despite his weakness. In Jeremiah's weakness, God will be with him and God will deliver him. This is what God said to him in verses 8 and 9. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. The Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth and said, I have put my words in your mouth. This is good news for us when we're weak when we know that we need God more than anything else, when we cry out for his all-sufficient and all-powerful grace, those are the ones whom God uses in supernatural ways. He's not discarding you to the heap of the broken, defiled, or useless. Just the opposite. In fact, one of my seminary professors says, and this is decades ago and it still rings true in my memory, the worst thing you have going for you is your righteousness when you know it. <laughs> and the best thing you have going for you is your weakness and failure when you know that. And because that's what drives you to him for his power, for his righteousness, for his forgiveness, for his spirit indwelling in you and flowing through you. The famous hymn, Come Ye Sinner, captures this well. Listen to these lines. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. God joyfully assures you that you're his, and that he is true to his promise to be with you and to deliver you through any difficulty or barrier in the ministry that he's laid upon you. And all of this love, acceptance, and strength is because of Jesus Christ. We read in Psalm 49, we can never ransom ourselves or deliver to God the price of our life, for the ransom of our life is so great that we should never have enough to pay for it. That's why we worship Jesus Christ. Your soul is of inestimable worth. To ransom you from eternal death required an infinite price. The costliness of the sacrifice denotes the efficacy of your salvation. The costliness of the sacrifice denotes the efficacy of your salvation. The price Jesus paid to ransom you was given with love, to create friends who would serve God in warm-hearted gratitude for grace. You were purchased with the costly blood of the Lamb, and because of that, God sets you on fire with the cross and will make your whole life strengths and weaknesses, successes and failures, fears and hopes, 
joys, and disappointments. He will make your whole life one burning sacrifice of gratitude to the blessed Savior who loves you and gave himself for you. Let's pray. Gracious God, may you cause each person here to experience more deeply your unwavering love in the immeasurable depth of your grace. Please work your consistent, incomparable, ever faithful, relentless, pursuing, unrestrained, extravagant, one-way love deep into our hearts and minds. May we truly accept that we are accepted in Christ and rest in your fatherly love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.